Okay. So this is module two. Uh, I'm going to do only two videos to see if this works out better than last time. So one video for the entire lecture and then one video for the lab. All right. But yes, in case of cyber attack, uh, break glass and pull cables. Uh, to begin with, it used to be that you could easily take malware and put it in families, like viruses, worms, Trojan horses, so on and so forth. That's not true anymore. What, is ha what has happened now is malware will take characteristics from different families and put them all into one. For example, a piece of ransomware could pretend to look like a, a legitimate program. Therefore, it already has the characteristics of, it, of ransomware itself and a Trojan horse. Uh, it could also have capability to spread either by user interaction or by itself, so being a virus or a worm. So reality, when we talk about malware, that is the, that is the term that we use. Uh, these terms that we're gonna cover are, are more specific if a piece of malware does one thing. But just note that, that in the industry, we no longer stay with, uh, with one, we can't no longer take a piece of malware and put it into a family because they have traits from other families. Uh, so the first family that we'll cover is the circulation. Uh, these spread rapidly to as many systems as possible. And there are two subcategories are viruses and worms. A virus acts like its biological counterpart in reproducing without a human interaction. They'll, they'll attach themselves to files or they'll create files of their own. The one of the most common are like macro viruses, the ones that are found in Microsoft Office files because somebody decided it's it's a bright idea to have a Microsoft Office document file be able to do other things. And someone else said, oh, look, I can use that to manipulate the system. Uh, viruses do not spread over the network. They depend on the actions of users in order to spread. This first picture that I'm showing you here is what's called an appender. It's attaching itself to the end of a file. So uh, in the file, it will insert a jump to where the code is and execute there. There's other forms like Swiss cheese, where it will take parts of itself and spread it across. And then everything has to be decrypted and put together in order for the whole code to execute. And there's also split doing similar to Swiss cheese, uh, but the parts are, are visible. They're just cut up into pieces all over the place. Don't require decryption, but requires to know where the pieces are to uh, read them in the right order in order to execute. Viruses are able to mutate, so they, are, uh, so they become harder to to track if you're going by a uh, signature alone. But again, a virus is not any longer a specific group anymore. It's more of a characteristic. A worm is able to use the network in order to replicate. They'll take advantage of a vulnerability that exists in multiple systems and, and exploit that in order to copy from one machine to another machine. Kind of like uh, when in a parking lot, there's a burglar looking around and uh, tries to find a, a, a door that's open or a window that's rolled down just enough to open. They'll try uh, car by car until they find one that is not secure and get in. And then they'll continue doing that to the next and the next and the next. In the infection, 
family of characteristics, because again, we're not, they are not uh, singular anymore. These guys embed themselves to the host system. The first one in this being the Trojan horses who pretend to be a benign program, but they do something malicious. Um, in this family, you can find the remote access Trojans or the rats. These are ones that give attackers unauthorized and unrestricted remote access that was not there before. Ransomware is part of the infection family. They'll encrypt data until a fee is paid, hopefully. Not all ransomware will, uh, will decrypt when the fee is paid. Some just encrypts, and even if you pay the ransom, there is no key to decrypt and everything is lost for good. One of the more infamous in this family is WannaCry. There's also crypto malware which is in a way deemed different, even though the two find, uh, find a vulnerable system, they encrypt the contents and ask for payment. The way that they function in the, back, in the background is different uh, between the two. Nonetheless, a crypto malware ha can have characteristics from the ones we just mentioned, like it could split itself up into many pieces onto a legitimate file or a legitimate application, reconstruct itself and then launch. Or pretend to be something that is legitimate like Windows Defender and then take over. Uh, rootkits are in the concealment group. These guys access the lower layers of the operating system uh, by making changes that are undetectable by the OS and common anti-malware scanning software. As long as the rootkit files are hidden and they're not visible by anything, uh, then they move on, uh, they evade any, uh, any measures that you have in place. A lot of these uh, characteristics carry with them extra functionalities, which we'll cover next. So again, we're, when we talk about malware, it could have all these characteristics, some of these characteristics, one of these, uh, but really we're just gonna use the term malware to define these things. So for example, spyware used to be its own little item. Spyware just watches what you do and sends that, the information that it gathers back up to a, uh, a home server. A piece of ransomware could do this or a Trojan horse could do this uh, as well. Keyloggers, keyloggers are fun. They keep track of everything you type. It doesn't matter that you have a super long password, a keylogger keeps track of every single button you type and will record it. There are hardware keyloggers like the one shown and there are software ones as well. Adware, this is just annoying. Tons of ads that are unnecessary. The goal of this is just to slow you down and or crash the computer. There are logic bombs. They're embedded into large programs that may not always be scanned and trigger when a specific action is taken or when uh, a certain, certain trigger is reached, like a certain day and time. Backdoors, 
can be easy to detect if you have something like a baseline. Then you'll know when something stands out on your network. Because backdoor is what they do is they connect an attacker to a machine. And the only way you'll be able to detect this kind of traffic is if you know what's supposed to be happening on your network, then you'll see this anomaly and notice, hey, look, there's a program that's trying to make a connection at an odd port and descending commands, sending bash commands or uh, Windows commands. We need to do something about that. There is also the bots or the botnet. These machines have a piece of malware installed and they will act when a command is given to them through the command and control server or a C2 or a CNC server. Uh, they, they by themselves don't necessarily uh, function on their own. They only function when given a command when you get a series of these computers together, that forms a botnet. So all that the, uh, the criminal does is send their command to the command and control server, and then from there it propagates out to the infected machines, and then the action happens. This is why it's harder to track down where botnets are coming from because you have, to, you have to find a infected system. You have to find where the command is coming from. So you search for the server. If you can find the server, then at least you can cut it off there. Even better if you can find out where the commands are originating from. Social engineering is another area in the many things that we have to keep our eyes open for. Uh, it exposes the biggest underbelly of our security. Because humans, not technology, is the weakest link. And yet, this is essential to your infrastructure. When you, when you are planning how you're going to protect yourself, one of the biggest questions is the users on your infrastructure, the users on your network. How will you train them? How will you prevent them from falling for a social engineering attack? These things rely on psychology, on the mental and emotional approach rather than any physical. So they rely on the clever manipulation of human nature in order to either get information or do something. For example, they could pretend to be the CEO. So they'll, they'll show authoritative uh, actions. They could intimidate, like telling them, hey, if you don't do this, then I will do the, this negative action, like speak to your manager or fire you or whatever. Uh, they could do things like consensus. You scratched my back, so let me scratch. You know, I scratched your back, so you scratch mine. Uh, there is scarcity or urgency, uh, like those calls that you get about the IRS has a, a warrant out for your arrest, so you need to do X, Y, and Z now um, or, or else. There's also impersonation, uh, pretending to be somebody that you know in order to lower your guard and have you do something you shouldn't do. Other things that play a part are things like providing a reason, projecting confidence, using evasion or diversion, making people laugh is also another way. You know, naturally, making somebody laugh lowers their defenses. And yes, the Twitter hack was social engineering. So some of the ways that social engineering manifests itself can be in the form of phishing, like in this PayPal picture, pretending to look like something it is not. It is not from PayPal, but they're trying to get the person to see, oh yes, it is, so let me go click and do whatever 
the thing is telling me to and end up uh, losing stuff. There are variations uh, to phishing. There is spear phishing, which is targeting specific users like CEOs, for example. Um, there is whaling, which is targeting the bigger fish, like a wealthy individual or a senior executive. And there is a thing called vishing with a V for telephone calls, because uh, the V is for voice, voice phishing. There's also spam, which we all, uh, which we all know and we're familiar with. Uh, there's hoaxes causing an alarm to generate an instant change in security configuration and a watering hole. Finding a website that is commonly used by the victim group and infect that site in order to reach targets. In your uh, lecture, I put two links that you can see the real effects of social engineering. Uh, here is a video of social engineering in action. And let me see if I can, yes, share my computer sound. So this might be loud uh, or it might just be right. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, At gmail .com? Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they, they, just gave, they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're going to have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. That is some real social engineering. There are also physical attacks that you have to watch out for. It's not just digital, it's also physical. Uh, this video is kind of silly, but it uh, covers uh, dumpster diving. Oh, hey, did you know that 100% of dumpster crime takes place in a dumpster? I didn't know that one either. People do this kind of stuff and then root around in your trash. Oh look, tax form. Now I know you're social. Don't do that kind of stuff. Make sure you're shredding your trash like this. You want confetti cut too. 
stuff that they can't assemble. <laughs> Don't breathe that. Or you can burn your trash. You may not have a burn bag like this, but you can still burn your trash. Just take it out, burn it. Don't throw stuff away like credit card forms either. So offers that the credit card company sends you, those are especially high on the list for identity thefts. You never know what you can find in a dumpster. There's a perfectly good apple. Ew. But the main point is true. Uh, you should properly destroy uh, anything, any paper-based confidential information properly. You should not just throw away tax forms or throw away manuals, uh, throw away receipts. Uh, for example, manuals are great because you can see what what uh, hardware, what version of hardware was recently purchased or the, uh, what they have. Uh, these are ways that someone can figure out how to impersonate getting, getting this information in order to properly uh, evade any suspicion when they call or when they show up. There's also tailgating. Only authorized people should go in to a, into a secure building. It shouldn't be that anybody can just waltz in uh, you know, without, without being checked. One of the most common ways for someone to get in is to, to, uh, to pretend to have an emergency, uh, distract authorized uh, people, uh, you know, by coming up with a, a fake emergency or also uh, pregnant. Those are two of the most common ways that someone figures out how to tailgate in. You also have shoulder surfing. If you don't have a, uh, a screen, a privacy screen on your phone, on your laptop, on your tablet, then anybody can see what you're doing. And if you're logging on to your bank, if you're doing anything confidential, well, anybody can see uh, without doing anything. And if they're able to remember what you type or you know, a hand gesture, they'll be able to replicate it later. These are all things that you need to be aware of, that you need to educate others on being aware of because these are, a lot of these, as you see, are very low hanging fruit, are either very low tech or uh, just not that complicated, yet they are very, very effective attacks. Any questions on, uh, on this content? Anti-malware is only as effective as the definitions. So uh, that's, that is the one problem of all that entire suite of defensive software is it's only as good as it knows. It, it could try figuring out odd behaviors through heuristics, but they tend to work best when they have a signature. So they're great for things that we know. They are not so great for things we don't know, like zero days. Right, like Norton, F-Secure, Avast, AVG. Uh, what else is there? Komodo, Kas uh, Kaspersky, all of them function in the same way. Uh, Trend Micro, uh, Bitdefender. You know, all of these are as good as the definitions that they have. Same, malware bytes. Um, I am on a Linux box, so I use Clam AV.
but being on Linux uh, does make me immune to most of the Windows stuff. That and going and not going to sites I shouldn't and or doing things I shouldn't also keeps me uh, sane, sane and safe. Other questions? Okay. Let me stop this recording.